Well, again, a very good evening to each and every one of you. It is a blessing to be here this evening, this Thursday evening, and we are continuing our studies in the book of Ephesians. We're just lifting some thoughts from Ephesians, and we want this evening to see God's incomprehensible love as it is given to us in Jesus Christ. We just want to focus on it because it is in focusing on God's love that we come to appreciate what he has done for us and what we are to be to each other. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me even as we begin. Father in heaven, we ask of you to anoint us with your Holy Spirit and to bless us even as we study these themes in the book of Ephesians. We are looking at knowing your incomprehensible love and in knowing that love, have it within our hearts that we can show it to others. We thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for... Our text for meditation, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14 way right through to verse 19. Ephesians chapter 3, read from verse 14 through verse 19. And even as we read this, it in itself speaks to our hearts. Paul says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. He goes on, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And look at verse 19 again, that and to know, and to know, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That is an awesome thought. Knowing a love that surpasses knowledge. Knowing a love that surpasses understanding. So it is a love that cannot be understood, but yet can be experienced. And when you experience God's love, you cannot give an explanation for it. But all you can do is to say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So when we think about love, what is love? The Greeks have different words that we translate into love. They are what you may call different types of love, love in various categories. You can have love for your spouse. You can have love for family members. You can have love for brethren. You can have love for God. So there are different types of love and the Greeks separate them. All right? So you can have eros, storge, agape, filio. These are the different types of love. Eros is the love for your spouse, for your lover. Storge, love for family. Filio, brotherly loves. Agape, the eternal self-sacrificing love of God. Now, a working definition of love, we can say that it is an intense feeling of deep affection. We can say that that is a working definition of love. An intense feeling of deep affection. You can, it is having a great interest and pleasure in something. So your heart burn you. A great interest and pleasure in something. Where you, and, and looking at the romantic, this is the eros, a deep, a feeling of deep romance or a sexual attachment 
fondness, tenderness, warmth, sympathy. So when we speak about love, you cannot separate feelings from it, but that is more so on the level of the human side of affection, deep affection. And this is necessary. God gave it to us and we should relish it. We should bask in it, that type of love. But love is both thought and feelings combined. Thought and feelings combined. Now, when you have feelings, you either have a strong feeling to be with someone or a strong feeling to be away from someone. You can have a feeling of detestation. So when you're looking at feelings, you can have strong feelings based upon your thoughts for or against a person. But the thing is, we have to come to a point of having strong feelings of detestation for sin on the one hand and intense love for the sinner on the next hand. We emotionally de detest and uh, hate sinful actions while we emotionally are drawn to the sinner. That is what God wants. That we detest the sin, but we love the sinner. So your feelings for a person then tell you whether or not you love that person or hate that person. How you feel towards the person will give you an indication as to whether or not you have good thoughts of endearment. You can emotionally hate a person while intellectually do things for them out of duty. So you can say, you know something? I am at this workplace. My boss tell me, told me what to do. I am going to do what he says. So you're doing what the boss says out of duty, but you have no real feeling, good feelings in your heart for your boss. Do you think that this can happen in marriages? Do you think that can happen in relationships with, in the household, with children and parents, that you're doing something for a person out of duty? For example, you can cook for a person out of duty. You can wash for a person out of duty. You can even engage in sexual intercourse with a person based upon duty. But there's no feeling of deep affection and love and endearment. That is a possibility. So you want really in your relationship, not only thoughts of doing good things for a person, but good feelings for the person. You get what I'm saying? So you oftentimes can gauge whether or not you love a person based upon how you feel towards them. And we know, yes, it is true that love is really a principle of action. That though you may feel a particular way, yet you engage in doing the right thing. That is true. And yet you can, to a very great extent, gauge whether or not you love based upon how you feel towards the person. So you must come to a point of hating uh, something that is wrong, that is being done, while loving the person, seeing that person as a child of God. All emotions and all expressions of love is from God. All emotions is from God. These deep feelings of affection towards others are really gifts from God. God made us with the ability to feel 
He made us with emotions. He does not want for us to have an emotionless experience with each other. He does not want for us to have an emotionless experience with him. So when you are in church, your heart should be longing out after God. And you know, this is something that I have found that many evangelicals and many Pentecostals have. They, they have oftentimes the feeling but yet there's something that is missing oftentimes. And in other realms, in other places, you have a truth and yet no deep feeling and longing after. You want both combined. Because we are not only intellectual beings, we are intellectual, emotional, volitional, and we want all to be involved in our worship to God. Like what Lesanto would normally say, when you're singing, you don't just go and memorize a song and come and sing words to a person. You have to feel the song. And when you feel the song, you transmit the feeling through the song. When you are speaking, you have to feel the message, and you will transmit the feeling of the message to individuals who would catch your spirit, who would catch the feeling. So people have to know that you are in love with God. But it is challenging because, you know, as human beings, we are so often very negative as human beings. Naturally, that is why human beings love a lot of uh, news. They will sit down and listen to the news all day. And the news is just filled with negative things just to, you know, you, you see from one negative thing to another negative thing to neg neg negative thing. And uh, there's no, usually there's no real positivity. We are very negative and we are drawn to the negative. But God's people must come to a point where they start viewing and relating to the positive and exude a positive atmosphere so that when you are in a company, when you come into a room, you know, you can bring a spirit into the room. You, you, you know that? You can bring a type of atmosphere into the room. Now, unlike the Greeks, the Hebrews, they have... Uh, one expression for love. The Greeks has, have, they have four. You have eros, storge, and filio, agape. But the Hebrews, they have one word. We're going to look at Psalm 119, 113. Let us look at it. Psalm 119, 113. It says, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I Love. Thy law do I love. Now, the Greeks would not say thy law would I eros. Because you cannot eros law. You cannot fill your law. All right? So, thy law do I love. And uh, the Hebrew word is a particular Hebrew word there, ahab ahib. Let us see it, ahab ahib, that Hebrew word. Ahab, Ahib, and it is to have affection for sexually or otherwise. So you have love, like a friend, family, just one word, Ahab, Ahib. So we are told in Genesis chapter 24, verse 67, notice this. And Isaac brought her into his mother's, that is, um, brought Rebecca into his mother's tent and took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. One word. That same word, Ahab, Ahib, Rebecca. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So notice that one word, Ahab, Ahib, he loved her. The Greeks would say, Eros. The Hebrews says, Ahab, Ahib, love. But that same word, 
is used in Genesis chapter 25, verse 28. I saw this as interesting. And Isaac, Ahab, Ahib, Esau, because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob, Ahab, Ahib. So notice that even the, the word used for family members is the same word used for lovers, Ahab, Ahib. Again, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, notice it. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Thou shalt not avenge. Thou shalt not avenge. Okay? Nor bear any grudge. Don't bear any grudges. If any person that, that, uh, does you anything, just forget it and move on. But thou shalt, what is that word? Ahab, Ahib, or Ahabe. Ahab, Ahabe. All right? That is the Hebrew expression. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt Ahab, Ahabe, thy neighbor as thyself. I am thy Lord. One word covers everything. So, one word will cover what you may say to love pleasure. They have a habit. Love wisdom, to love righteousness, to love pureness of heart, to love silver, to love abundance, to love truth, to love judgment, to love that one word is used by the Hebrews when the Greeks, they have so many different expressions for the word love. Again, we are told in 1 Samuel chapter 18. This is an interesting one. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3. It says, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Same word. It have a habit. One word. But Dave, Jonathan's love for David was not the love that a man has for his wife. But it is the same word. Just as so we use one word, love. The Hebrews used one word, Ahab Ahabi, which is love. The Greeks would use different expressions. We are told that Jonathan's love for David caused him to prefer David above himself. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 4. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even his sword and his bow and his girdle. So Jonathan loved David. He was a best friend. And... Uh, he would have given David everything. And this was not an unrighteous type of love as we have between men today in the world. This was a pure love. And this is the type of love that God would want for his people to have because this is an incomprehensible love that God has for us, that he has stripped himself of everything and gave it. To us. And now he wants for us to be able to do the same for others. You, you know, it is so difficult. Isn't it? It is so difficult. Now you remember when Saul, David's, Jonathan's father, wanted to kill David because he knew that David was anointed to be the one to succeed him on the throne. But you know what? Jonathan knew that also. And Jonathan would have given Saul anything. But, sorry, Jonathan would have given David anything, but Saul wanted to kill him. In 1 Samuel 19, reading from verses 1 and 2, and onward. Notice, notice this. 
And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Both Jonathan and Saul knew that David was anointed to be what? The heir, the next person that would sit on the throne. It therefore meant that Jonathan, who would have been the rightful heir of the throne, would not have been able to sit on it. But Jonathan did not care about the throne. He loved David more than even the throne. That is friendship. That is when you are caring for something. That is love. That is incomprehensible. And it says, And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. So Jonathan's love for David even surpassed his loyalty to his father. He says, Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a scarlet secret place and hide thyself. It continues, And David swear moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eye. And he said, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. So love for his father didn't interfere with his love that he had for David. That is love. That is friendship. Oh, how. L listen, this is a rare type of love. That it is so difficult to find in the world today, even between the people of God. It's hard to find between husbands and wives, between lovers, but, but even between the people of God, it's so difficult to find people who will just give themselves and give their all for their friend, a best friend. If you can find at least two persons in this world to be a friend to you, like how Jonathan was to David, you are a fortunate person. Blessed, I should say. Person that would love you as Jonathan loved David. And like Jonathan, what do we do? We allow family to inhibit our expression of love for fathers, family. We allow church brethren to go between us and friends. We allow fear of punishment, fear of abandonment, fear of disassociation, fear of a censure to turn our backs on brothers and on sisters. I don't want to be treated badly and therefore I am not going to speak to you even though I wouldn't mind speaking to you. If some person sees me speaking to you, then... I can get in trouble. I can I, I can't afford to associate with you because you're bad news. The time has come for us to know God's incomprehensible love. Jonathan knew David, and he knew that the throne was going to David, and yet he made a covenant with David that he was going to protect him. This is 1 Samuel chapter 20, reading from verse 14. 1 Samuel 20, reading from verse 14. And thou shalt not, on, not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off Thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. Now, this is Jonathan speaking to David, all right? And Jonathan is telling David, listen, 
I know that you're going to take the throne rather than me. When my father dies, I know that I am not going to be the one that's going to take the throne. I know that it's going to be you. But I just want for you to do one thing. This is what I want for you to do. Remember me. I remember my family. Don't cut off my family. This is absolutely amazing. What, what do you think a normal man, a regular man would do? He would say, no. He would cut him down. Cut down, David. Because, and that's what Saul was doing. That's a natural heart. Saul was seeking to cut David out. Kill him because David was not going to allow his seed to continue to occupy the throne because he knew that David was going to sit on that throne. But Jonathan says, no. I know that you're going to get the throne rather than me. Just do not cut off my family. He continued in verse 16. He says, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him for he loved him as he loved his own soul. It is like he's saying I know that you're going to reign in my stead David. I know that you're going to reign instead of me David but that's not going to stop me from loving you. I love you. What a love. And you know, Jonathan risked his own life for David by defending him. David was going to be the one to take the throne and yet Jonathan risked his own life for David. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 30, then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? He continues, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor the kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Wherefore Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. <laughs> Are we willing to take such a risk, a risk for a friend, even a friend that is going to take our place, our position. Jonathan knew that David was going to take the throne of Israel rather than himself, and he defended and protected David from his father. His father wanted to kill him because the father knew, but he decided, though I know I love you, David, as my own soul, I don't want any harm to come to you. I would prefer for you to occupy the throne. Would we do that? Would we do that? That is truly an incomprehensible love. You know, it's easy to sit and say, yes, and that is something I would do, but you see, we seek to preserve ourselves. We seek to preserve our things. Are we willing to risk our reputation for our brother, for our sister? Are we willing to risk our jobs? Are we willing to risk our position, our family, our friend? Are we willing, willing to risk even our lives for that person or those persons that we regard to as our friends? Friends are rare. They are a rare commodity in this earth. A friend is a person that is like Jonathan to David. That is friendship. We have many acquaintances. So you may be a very popular person with a lot of acquaintances, 
but you don't really have a lot of friends. Think about a man like Elvis Presley. Renowned singer. Loved by Americans. Had a lot of people all around him continually. And yet he was lonely. He was lonely. Why? Because the carnal mind usually seek to be with you and want to be around you, especially if you have something that you can offer them. And rich people know it. And therefore they don't trust human beings because they are part of humanity. So it's very difficult to find a true, a true friend. You may have a lot of acquaintances, even in church, a lot of acquaintances, but a true, true friend. That is a rare commodity. Yes, you know what I mean? He had fans, not friends. And that is what we may have. We may have a lot of fans. But do we have true friends? Paul's classic definition of love, and I'm going to read from the contemporary English version. Listen to what he says. Love. Love is kind and patient. Are we kind to each other? Are we patient? Never jealous? Never boastful? Never proud? Never rude? Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. Get angry and frustrated and vexed. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Is this coming home? It doesn't keep a record of the wrongs that others do. Do we have God's incomprehensible agape? Do we have that love? He continues. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. Love never fails. Amen. Challenging. Yes, yeah. Yes, um, Latoya. Never fails. Never, ever, ever. It does not give up. It does not ever fail. So often we fail each other. We become upset and angry and frustrated and uh, impatient and, yeah, at our wits and done with you. Love's eyes are closed to the faults of others while his ears are open to their cries. There are two components of true love. You have justice and you have mercy. You have freedom. You have compassion. You have righteousness. And you have forgiveness. You have truth. And you have understanding. You have choice. And you have second chances. Some come down hard on the side of justice and freedom, and righteousness and truth and choice, and feel in mercy and compassion and forgiveness and understanding, tenderness and second chances. Are we in balance in the expression of our love? You remember that he forgave Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, over and over 
and over and over again and again. He never tired of forgiving Mary. Whenever Mary went and uh, whatever, whenever she came, come, <laughs> arms of love. You know, it says in Mark 16, verse 9, very, very early on the first day of the week, after Jesus had risen to life, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Earlier, he had forced seven demons out of her. And this does not mean that she just had seven demons in her. It means seven times. Whenever she fell, forgiveness. Whenever she fell, forgiveness. Embracing. He never tired of forgiving. He was always forgiving. His arms were always open. He was always of compassion. Never pushed her away. Love. Love. It is the love of God that will lift us beyond what the human can do. Only the love of God. The incomprehensible love of God. It lifts, lifts us beyond what the human can do. Human love cannot get this done. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Peter came up to the Lord and asked, how many times should I forgive someone who does something wrong to me? Is seven times enough? Don't you think that seven times is enough? I would think so. But Jesus answered, not seven times, but 70 times. Seven. 70 times seven. How many times are you willing to forgive your spouse, your children, your friend, your boss? How many times are you willing to forgive? I hope that Charmaine ain't going to sleep as yet. <laughs> but as we come down to our close, yeah. <laughs> I like this statement. It's taken from a book called Heavenly Places, page 12, paragraph 2. I love this statement. It says, God's love for the fallen race is a peculiar manifestation of love, a love born of mercy, for human beings are all undeserving. Mercy implies the imperfection of the object towards which it is shown. It is because of sin that mercy was brought into active exercise. Sin is not the object of God's love, but of his hatred. But he loves and pities the sinner. The erring sons and daughters of Adam are the children of his redemption. Through the gift of his son, he has revealed towards them his infinite love and mercy. Praise God. Are you willing? to extend this peculiar manifestation of love born of mercy to the one that is hurting you. This is not an easy thing. It is really impossible for the flesh to do. For you to be able to get it done, you must be born again. Father in heaven, we ask of you in the name of Jesus that you would have mercy upon our sinful souls for we have not loved thee as we ought and we have not loved each other as we ought we have not embraced the ones who are hurting us as we ought Lord make us more 
like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah.